Okay, I'm recording this, so it's get it's definitely quiet here. Where's my word? Okay, um, hopefully I got this right. Hopefully I haven't read did this lecture last week with you. If not, uh, you'll, see, you'll hear it twice. Uh, before I get started, I, I'm not sure how I'm going to handle next week, but I'm going to be out of town Monday through Wednesday of next week. So since this class meets Monday and Tuesday, I will probably be recording the lecture and placing a, a homework assignment online. So it's probably the easiest way to handle that versus have someone cover the lecture or try to make it up afterwards. So I'll be recording something this week that I'll be posting before I leave on Sunday. So I'm going to be going to a workshop in JB Monday through Wednesday, so I'll be leaving Sunday afternoon. Not there. And I do have a lab that I'll be posting hopefully later this today if our internet upstairs comes back. If not, I'll take it home and post it from home. Not there. So. Uh, everyone have a good break. Everyone went home and rested and got and feel real energetic, right? Or did you, or did you do like I did and come come back to work to rest? That's there. So actually, this week was very busy for me. My shipping container with all my stuff from the U.S. was delivered on Thursday, so that meant that all day Thursday I was carrying boxes and moving refrigerators and and sofa beds and beds and everything else from a 20-foot shipping container into my house. So I spent most of, and I was doing this, I took Friday off from it and then spent all day Saturday and yesterday rearranging the house a little bit. So my back is in bad shape and I'm definitely worn out. So <laughs> that there. And one of the things you'll keep in mind is everyone in this room is under 30. Probably everyone in this room is under 25 is probably a good assessment. You get up closer to 60 like I am, then you don't recover quite as quickly from days of doing that kind of abuse to your body out there. So, all right. Well, let's get pick up right where we left off. No one forgot anything over the break. You you read your notes and you kept up to date and you know you remember everything that that was covered. We did a lab just before you left, and that's still fresh in your mind. Is that right? Yeah, that there. So tomorrow when we get in the lab, you'll. We won't have to re, you know, repeat anything. You'll, you'll know right where to pick off that there. And I'll talk about tomorrow's lab here as as we go through there. Today I'm going to that there, and I'm hoping I did this lecture last week with the microcontroller course. So this this is the microprocessor group, right? This is the 200 group, right? That there. So so, so I, I I sometimes get you guys mixed up. This or is this microcontrollers? Which group is this? What? This is microcontrollers? Or, or micro P? Micro P. The two classes are actually very similar this time. That's why they're mixed up. Next semester they'll, they'll start spreading out, so you won't see the same material next, next, next time. But this time they're seeing the same material because they used the 8086 strictly last semester in their microprocessor course. So now that I'm teaching the 8051, I have to start from, from the zero. Since you're seeing the 8051 this semester, next semester, you get to do more work than they do, they're doing this, this semester. That's the bad news. But it's a lot of it's repeat. So I'm going to go through the system clock, the crossbar, and the general purpose I.O. and setting up the chip. We won't be using that for this lab. I'll talk about this week's lab here in a few minutes up there. So as we go through through this here, We've got 
several things to talk about, and this is a relatively long discussion, this, this, this lecture here. There, and as I said, I may end up sitting down at some point simply because my back is going to give us. We have, we can either use an internal or an external oscillator with this chip, and I think we've talked a little bit about that. Today we're going to get into the nuts and bolts, or the how do we set up the oscillator. We're going to look at how we actually program this chip to do things out there. We're going to look a little bit at the watchdog timer today on how we set that up and, and how, what, that, what that does. And then we're going to look at our port pins, output modes, and configuring our ports as inputs or outputs. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the crossbar right there. So today we're actually going to start looking at these special function registers and how we configure this IC the way that we want to do that. There. So this is really where we're looking at the chip itself. Up there. So as we look at the system clock, inside the 8051, we've got a up here. We've got is considered the heartbeat. In other words, everything happens in this microprocessor on the rising edge of a clock or a falling edge of the clock, right there. So. The slides talk about the, the F020. We're using the F850, the, the same, you know, same family. Everything applies. We have multiple clocks that we can put into this here. We can choose to have no external clock. So when we say no external clock, means we're going to configure this to operate off of the internal oscillator right here. There's an internal oscillator right here, or excuse me, right here. The internal clock oscillator is right up here that there. Or we could go through a external clock can either be a clock signal itself, it can be just a capacitive network to ground, it can be an RC circuit, or it can be a, a crystal a crystal. These are all the various inputs that we can drive into the input circuit and we can configure our clock on how that's worked that there. Now one of the questions somebody will ask is since we have an internal oscillator, why don't we just use it all the time? And right here is the reason. Is, 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 everybody see what I'm underlining here? That the internal oscillator operates at 16 megahertz plus minus 20 percent. Plus minus 20 percent isn't very accurate. That there. How would you like it if your salary as an employee is 5,000 ringgits per month, plus or minus 20%, depending on the, the boss's mood. Right there. So some months you might get paid 4,000, some months you might get paid 6,000. Now, if you're on commission and your salary is based on how much you work and how much you sell or how much you produce, that might make sense. But that's there. So a plus or minus 20% isn't very accurate. So if we're using this for a controller, for example, at controlling the speed of, say, a automobile up there, and it varies plus or minus 20%, and you set it at 100 kilometers an hour, means it could be going 80 kilometers an hour or 120 kilometers an hour up there. So that is not a very accurate clock. It's accurate enough for some applications. For many, it's not. For example, if we're going to do serial communications, it's probably not accurate enough. You know, in other words, if we're going to be talking to things like a printer or a modem or another price processor, and we're using some type of communications protocol that is time dependent, such as RS-232, which is a serial communications that there, that's not accurate enough. We would have to use a crystal or some other clock generation. So that there. Many applications, you know, are not time dependent. If it's not time dependent, then plus or minus 20% is probably accurate enough. If we're trying to maintain the fluid level of a tank, or a particular color of paint, or a particular, you know, let's see, temperature in a room, or a particular chemical balance in some kind of processing that there, then we're you know we're monitoring you know we're, we're monitoring other sensors that are not time sensitive plus or minus 20% is okay 
But as soon as we're trying to do something with time, this plus minus 20% is a big problem right there. And I should also point out that this particular processor, its maximum clock speed is 25 megahertz. By today's world of high speed processors, and when I say processors, I'm talking microprocessors, i7, i5 microprocessors for Intel products that they're, they're operating in the four and five you know, gigahertz range. You know, they're, they're at least 100 times faster. <laughs> right there, probably more like four or five hundred times faster. Right there. But this is a microcontroller and it doesn't need that kind of speed. So this, this is our clock. So what we're looking at here is we've got multiple inputs for our, our clock right there. And what we're essentially looking at here is that upon reset, the MCU or the microcontroller unit operates from the internal at a typical frequency of two megahertz. In other words, if we just power this thing up and we don't tell it to do anything else, it's going to use the internal clock at 2 megahertz. Now, as we said in the previous slide, it, the internal oscillator operates at 16 megahertz, but it's got some divide bys where we're going to operate there. So we've got some signals here that, we, that, that right here we're going to talk about this. This oscillator control register right here, that's safe special function register. Now I know I talked about special function registers before the break, right? And I realize that you've had a week of sitting at home, playing with your younger brothers and sisters, getting in fights with your parents, or whatever you do, eating lots of good food, you probably forgot that discussion, special function registers. But special function registers are those registers in the 8051 family that configure this here. So when we look at this here, we've got this is our oscillator cross there. This tells us which oscillator we're going to use. This here sets up our internal clock that there. So these are the names of special function registers. These are bit n names inside that there. In slides as I go a little further, we'll explain what these bits are and how we configure this up, configure this. And keep in mind that this is going to be probably a final exam question or two, is how do you configure this to use a internal clock at 4 megahertz. And you would have to tell me how you would do that. Now you'll have access to the data sheet to do that. That there. So, that, that there. So, all right. That there. So the internal clock is configured, starts up at 2 megahertz, and that's the default frequency that it turns up. It can maybe be configured to operate at other frequencies of 4, 8, and 16. You notice that what we have is there, is we start off at the oscillator operates at 16 megahertz, and we're going to divide it by one, that gives us 16 megahertz. We're going to divide it by two, that gives us eight megahertz. We're going to divide it by four, that gives us four megahertz, or we're going to divide it by eight, and that gives us two megahertz. So we divide that frequency down in order to get these lower frequencies. The oscillator always runs at 16 megahertz, but it's configured to operate at other frequencies there. Again, this is a key thing there, that there is the accuracy of this is only plus or minus 20%. That's not very accurate. You know, just kind of re repeating that right there is a, if you had a, an exam question, so when would you not use the internal oscillator? When you need a frequency more accurate than 20%. That would be the answer to that right there. When would you not use the internal oscillator right there? So many applications do not need an, an accurate clock. I gave you a number of examples of that earlier, you know, where we're looking at other sensors out there. So anytime you're doing something where you're measuring speed using the timers and that, you may have to be looking at external out there. And sometimes 20% is good enough right there. Now, we used to have a saying in the U.S., close enough for government work. And that basically meant that military contracts were written with a you know, plus or minus that there. So we have the internal clock control register, and it is called OSCICN. And these slides will be posted that there, well, along with the video that there. So these are the eight bits that are available to you right there. The seven 
Bit number seven is the missing clock enable bit. That's there. This particular bit, if we set it to zero, ah, that there. Yeah, I can always tell that the first day after the break, people are going to squ squeeze in late. That there. There. Okay, bit seven is one of these things. It's a little bit like the watchdog timer. If something happens and the clock disappears, then this bit, if it's set to a one, will after 10 milliseconds reset the processor. Now this is a this is somewhat handy if we're going to be using an external clock from somewhere and something happens to our circuitry and that clock disappears. That there. So this is a type, this is a missing clock enable bit, that there, which again, like the watchdog timer, which we talked a little bit before, it just kind of monitors and makes sure that that clock is moving. If the clock stops moving after 10 milliseconds, then we do a reset and try to fix things, that there. Bit six and seven, we don't care. You know, they're not used right there. Bit seven or four is a internal oscillator frequency ready flag. That just simply is a flag that we would read and it will say that we're operating at the correct frequency internally. And what that means is if is we set this up and we change the frequency by writing to, and again, bits one through zero, right here, those are our divide bys, right there. If we change that there, then it's going to take a few clock cycles before the correct speed is set. So, so this simply, simply tells us that we're at the correct speed, that there. Bit three is our clock select, and that says we're going to use either an internal or external clock. So this is how we select an internal or an external clock. And then our internal oscillator enable bit is going to be either disabled or enabled. And keep in mind, if you're going to use the internal clock, you have to, you have to enable the oscillator. Not there. Now, sometimes you'll in, enable the oscillator when you're using an external clock because you may switch back and forth. There are times in our software where we might want to use a very accurate high-speed clock for certain applications, such as communications or timing, but then go to a slower clock in order to conserve power in a standby or idle mode. One of the things to keep in mind that when we talk about microprocessors or, or microcontrollers or digital electronics, the speed, when you double the speed, you quadruple the power consumption. It's a squared function, that's there. So if we want to have high bat long battery life on something that's battery powered, then we try to run it as slow as possible. We also will keep our power, our heat dissipation down, that's there, that's there. And I know any of you that have used your cell phone, when you're banging, 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 watching videos, that there. In videos on a cell phone, <coughs> do two things. One is there's a lot of a lot of processing power being done to process the video. Video takes a lot of processing power when you're looking at a microcontroller. And on your cell phone, you've got a ARM processor. Whether you got an Apple or an, or an Android, you're using an ARM microcontroller for, for your cell phone, and it's doing the image process, doing the video processing, and it's banging away at a fairly high speed. So if you're watching a movie, it's really sucking the power, and your phone gets warm, right? <laughs> Doesn't your phone get warm when, when you sit there watching a movie? Why is it getting warm? Because you're operating this thing at the highest, the highest speed in order to process that. Plus, you're, if you're down, watching YouTube, you're also downloading a lot of data. That's there, and of course, if you're on any of these prepaid plans, you're also paying a lot of money for watching a lot of videos on YouTube, right? I don't know how expensive it gets. I don't watch video on YouTube over my over my uh, cell phone connection. I'll, I'll use my PC for that. So, that there. So, so this sets up our, our, this. so bit three says whether we want the internal or out external clock, and bit two says that we want the internal oscillator enabled or disabled. Obviously, if you're using the internal, internal oscillator as a system clock, you have to enable it. And then bits one and zero is those four divide bys. 
if you have one one that's at 16 megahertz, it's one zero, eight megahertz, zero one, four megahertz, zero zero is two megahertz, right there. Upon reset, the reset value is the missing clock enable bit is set to zero. These two that we don't care about, this here is going to be set to one because it's already, you know, it's already set up there. There, one internal clock there. Zero is we're we're using the internal oscillator, right there. One is we en enable the internal oscillator, and zero zero we're setting it to two megahertz, right there. That's what the initial value of that register is. If we want to change the frequency, all we have to do is write to that. Out there, it's just simply do a move, O S C I N C, comma, and whatever we want to, to put in that there. It's a very easy thing to change our clock frequency. All we do is just do a move operation into that special function register, and that changes our would change that frequency right there. So if I ch if I did a move to, you know, let me just grab my pen and I'll just write on it here, right there. If we did a move, oh, right here, right here. If we just did a move, and we said O S C I C N, comma, and we said zero 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 one zero one one B. That's going to just change our frequency to 16 megahertz right there. Because these two bits right here is what changes our frequency right there. If we change this, if we want to use an external clock, we'd, we would do a move. And I'm going to put OSCICN, comma. And we want to use an external clock, we would still go zero. Or we could put a one there if we want to. Zero, zero, right there. All right, we're going to just say just say zero here at that point. It doesn't matter. And here we're going to put a one here for the external clock, and we're going to disable that, and then we'll just write zero zero right there. And so this particular word right here is the only thing we've set is is right here, and that tells us we're going to use the external clock right there. We don't really care about anything else in there because that particular bit tells us that we're going to be using the external oscillator as a system clock. That, that there. So we just simply write to this register. That's how we set up the clock. It's very easy once you you see that there. So there. So the external oscillator, the most accurate type of oscillator is a crystal. A, you know, and you can buy crystals at various speeds out there. Typically, the speeds when you buy these crystals look a little weird because the reason they are selected is because they divide down to a particular baud rate for serial communications right there. So, but there we'll talk a little bit here in a second about the one used you know, on the 20 board that out there. Capacitor, if we want to use very, very low frequencies, and when I talk about low frequencies, we're talking two or three kilohertz, not in the megahertz. We may just use a capacitor or a resistor capacitor circuit. These will get us frequencies that are extremely low and very low power. That there, and typically we would use that there when we're in idle mode. We just operate at kind of an idle speed where this thing draws almost zero battery power, and then when it wants to do something, we switch back to the internal oscillator. Right there, so we have that that there. And the CMOS clock is actually, if we have multiple chips processors in the same system and we want to run them all on the same clock for various reasons, we would have a, a, chip, a clock generator like we talked about with the 8086, you know, where the 8086 required this, that 8284, is it 82, the 8224 clock generator chip. And don't quote me on that. We'd have to go back and look at the book on the 8086. But there's a clock generator chip that the 8086 and the 8088 had to use in order to generate the clock. 
there was no clock built into it. You had no crystal that you could hook up to it. You had to have the CMOS clock generator. This, you don't have to have the clock generator, but you could use a clock generator if you want. So these are our four options for, for external clocks. When we would use any of these, it depends. Uh, let me just kind of point them out because that there, and you might want to write these down as you take your notes or that there, is we would use a crystal if we need a very high accurate clock, very, very accurate clock. So any kind of timing operation, we would use that there. So if we want to control speed where we're counting the, counting the speed by how many clock pulses there are between clicks of a wheel, that type of thing, we would use a very high operate, that's crystal. Capacitor resistive or very low power operations if we want to go to very low frequencies. And those two are interchangeable at, at, at there. And then the CMOS is typically used with multiple devices in the same system that have to share a common clock that there. So those are the four types of clocks plus the internal clock. The cheapest and the dirtiest and the easiest is always the internal clock. That's always the easiest because it's built into the chip. You have nothing else to tie to it. You don't use up any of your pins. So the internal clock is, is by all means easiest. And that's the only one we, we've got access to on our boards <laughs> is that there. So, okay. As we go through the external crystal, right there, the external crystal on the Toolstick University is shipped from the factory. We don't have that particular one. You know, I actually have one in my office, but we, we didn't buy it for this class, that there. But it does have a crystal on it, and it operates at 22.184 megahertz. And the reason is, is that generates a 19.2 baud rate for serial communications very cleanly that there so that particular chip board has a serial port where you connect can talk to it our our board does not so so we, we won't be doing anything with that there so that's why is specific crystal is because it's useful for providing a system clock suitable for high baud rate generation for serial communication for the UART you know that just that, you know that's why they picked that crystal and it's a very common crystal for 8051s that do serial communications right there. You'll see that 22.1184. You know, it sounds like a weird frequency for that to become a standard. But as it turns out, it divides down real cleanly for a particular baud rate that's a common baud rate. And when I say baud rate, that's serial communications bit per second right there. Right there. And did you cover serial communications in your basic digital class? I'm sure it was mentioned to you, but do you remember it? No? <laughs> that there. But serial communications is, you know, your, your data transmits over a single wire one bit at a time. Hmm? Yeah, that there. So, but serial communications is a way of, a microprocessor will talk to the outside world right there. It used to be we could do it over phone wire lines. Now, of course, they use fiber optic mode, modems right there. Okay, then we've got a couple other things up there. This is the external oscillator control register. Just as we had the oscillator control register, we have one for controlling the external oscillator up there. This one's a little simpler. The first one is bit seven, just simply says that the crystal oscillator is unused or not yet stable, or it's running and it's stable. You know, we read that and it tells us whether or not it's seen a crystal, an oscillator out there work running that there. It's a bit that we could read that there. The next four bits are our mode. External is grounded internally. System clock is brought in on pin one. System clock is divided by two right there. RC oscillator is divided by two. And crystal oscillator mode, and it has a divide by two. So we can divide our fre incoming frequency by two at this particular point. And when we say external pin is internally grounded, normally that would be used if we're not using the external oscillator. We would just go ahead and ground that pin internally. That's a zero, one, zero means that we're going to bring an external clock from a CMOS generator right there. 
Here we're going to bring in 011, we're going to bring in an external clock from a CMOS clock generator, and we're going to divide by 2. So we divide it by 2. 10x, we don't care about this 1 or z whether that's 1 or 0. If we put 10 in there, we're going to take an RC or a capacitor, uh, that there, and we always divide that by 2. That, you know, we don't have a, we don't have a choice. We either with the CMOS and the crystal we can divide or not divide, but with the capacitor or the RC network we have to divide by two, right there. And then then the last two one one, and then zero is crystal oscillator and crystal oscillator divide by two. So this tells us what type of clock we're bringing in on the external clock, right there. And of course this has to match our hardware. So if, if you put a crystal on there and you set this to 101 right here, it, it's going to really mess this thing up because the, the clock generator is expecting to see a very low frequency and all of a sudden it sees a very high frequency. It's not going to work for, properly. So this, these three pins have to match what our hardware is going to look like right there. Right there. Pin 3 we don't use and then pins 2 through 0 is we control our frequency a little bit more detailed and that's given, you know, should be the next slide right there, or maybe it doesn't right there. But this allows us to external frequency control bits right there. These are our divide bytes, like they're similar to what we had there. I, this set of slides doesn't give the exact data on what our divides by, but they're very similar where we divide by 2, 4, 8, or 1, 2, 4, or 8. And actually, you've got three bits, so you can divide by probably, there's more options up there. But we can divide our frequency down up there, is what the, that's there for our external oscillator frequency control bit. So these are the two registers that control our clock right there. We have two registers that control our clock. The first register is the OSCCIN, and this was OSCXCN that there. The OSC CIN is the one that controls the internal oscillator and tells it whether it's going to be an internal or external oscillator. This controls the external oscillator if you're using it. Now if you switch, if you select OSC CIN to use the internal oscillator, you can ignore this register. It's, it's never even looked at by the microcontroller. It doesn't care because we're using the internal oscillator, so it's not going to look for any of this right here. So this particular register is only valid if we're in the external oscillator mode, right there. And as I said, we're getting into the nuts and bolts of this here, so it's getting a little bit more technical, a little bit, I should say, a little bit more boring, <laughs> right there. But these are the things that will drive you crazy. If we're going to use the external, if we configure the external oscillator, right there, we wait for a milliseconds, and then we switch it. All this is simply saying is that we're going to, when we switch to the external oscillator, we got to give it time to stabilize. That's all this particular out there. And the key thing is we're looking at this bit XTLVD, which is this top bit right there, that bit 7. That's the one that tells us, that tells the processor that the external oscillator is running at approximately the right speed and stable. Out there. So all this particular full chart does is we configure it by writing to those those seven bits, bit seven, six through zero. We wait for at least a millisecond. In other words, we just have because you remember when this thing starts up, it's going to be running on the internal oscillator at two megahertz when we first power it up. And so upon reset, it's running on the internal oscillator, and we have to switch it to the external. That there. So so it's running at it's running at two megahertz and on the internal oscillator so we configure the external oscillator and we wait before it come, become valid and then we switch that we set the bit clock select bit in the in the other control register that changes it that there we we set that bit remember we can clear a bit or set a bit right there so we set that bit and that changes and by changing that bit all we're doing is changing the clock from the external to the internal 
and we're changing the frequency in which this thing is operating. We're going from 2 megahertz up to 25 megahertz, just like that. All right, there, just by changing that one bit. Once, assuming we've got a 20, 25 megahertz clock going there. That's all this. This is the code for that right there. This is, as I said, this is written in C. Not there, but again, the, the, uh, the assembly language would be up, would be very similar to this. We, we set our, we're setting up our external clock right there. External clock is set to 111 because our frequency is above 6.7 right there. Again, that part wasn't given to us out there. Crystal oscillator mode is set to 110. And that 110 is crystal oscillator mode with no divide by two, right there. So that there, we set to 111 because the frequency is greater than that. That table is not given in these slides, right there. And divide by two mode with divide by two, we, we change it to 77. So, so we have a choice which one we're going to do right there. This sets it up for this sets it for uh, whatever the crystal is, and this sets it up for whatever the crystal is divided by two. It just changes one bit right there. Right there. This is our one millisecond delay. And if you take two megahertz and divide by 9,000 times three clock cycles, what does that come up to? Probably should be somewhere around a millisecond there. Right there. And then we, sit, then we go into a wait mode and all this is is wait until while not oscillator control register and bit zero you know we're doing an and here so this is going to be a one or a zero depending on whether or not that bit is is set or not right there so what we're doing is we're waiting for that bit 7 to be set right there this that's what this command does right here while not this is that register and we're anding it with eight zero hex which is one zero 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 so if that's a zero that means that that bit has not been set if it's not a zero then that bit has been set right there so we're just waiting for that to be occur and then this one right here then switches our clock to our inter to our external clock so this is the code that we, you would see the change. This code does this right here, right there. So this is configure the external clock. That's what this line here does. Wait one millisecond. That's what this line does. Wait for the external clock valid bit bit to be set high. That's what this line does. And then switch the clock to the external clock right there. And that's what this line here does. So this is the C code to initialize the external clock right there. Okay, moving on to our watchdog timer. The watchdog timer runs off the system clock, and what it does is anytime the watchdog timer overflows, it's going to reset the processor. So it's a clock that just simply, or it's a timer that's going to run. If it runs long enough and it resets, or overflows and resets the processor, which means that we didn't do something to that there. The purpose of the watchdog timer is to keep make sure that our program is executing properly. If it gets hung up in a loop or waiting for an input that doesn't occur or something happens to our program that locks up, then we want the watchdog timer resets our processor right there. Now the watchdog timer doesn't correct for bad programming. If you're, a, you know, if you're a bad programmer and you write an infinite loop, the, the watchdog timer is just going to keep resetting the processor. It doesn't solve that problem. What it does do is it solves the problem is every now and then hardware goes off the lunch, doesn't do what it's supposed to do, and just needs to be reset. And I'm sure everybody's had a VCR, or not VCR, a DVD player, or a computer, or a phone that is just locked up, right? No apparent reason it's just locked up. Well, if it's a phone or a DVD player and you get that screen where it just freezes and doesn't do anything, you can unplug it and plug it back in and that essentially, that there, 
But if this happens to be a gasoline pump, I keep using that example, that's pumping gasoline into your motorcycle, you don't want it to keep pumping gas all over the, and have no way of shutting that motor, that pump off. You know, you want to be able to have the processor reset itself and shut the pump off before you get 25 gallons of gasoline all over you and the guy across the way flips the cigarette down, right? <laughs> you know, bad things happen with, right there. You know, same thing is, you know, it's the speed control on your, on your brand new Mercedes that controls your speed. You, you get the speed control that there, are, are those popular? In the States, I always had cars that had cruise control. We call them cruise control. That you hit a button and it keeps the car at the same speed. You know, I, 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 in Malaysia, I buy cheap cars, so I don't, I don't have that in my car, but do they have those in, in, in car, some high-rank cars here, cruise controls? Okay, well, in the U.S., they have these cruise control that will keep your car, you hit a button and, and the car will keep going at, say, 90 kilometers an hour, and it'll just keep on going. You take your foot off the gas and it just keeps going 90 kilometers an hour. Right there. It's called a cruise control. And it's just so your foot doesn't get tired. Of course, in the U.S., you can also drive eight, nine hours and never stop. <laughs> Here. <laughs> Trust me, I did the drive from Indiana to California before I started working here. It, and if you look at the map, that's a 26-hour drive. Straight. <laughs> that's there. I did it over five, day, six days. You know, we stopped and spent nights and did round trips. But that's a, you know, and you know that it's a long drive. So distances are a lot longer, is what I'm trying to say. Say that there. So. But if you know if you if your Franco processor or controller is controlling the speed of your car, then you don't want it to lock up and just simply keep feeding more and more gas to your you know to your fuel injection system, and your car is now going 250 kilometers an hour before the engine blows up. <laughs> that there. So so you want that there. So again, before the watchdog there, you have to restart the watchdog timer. Now. You know, programming lingo is that we we normally write a routine called barking dog, which means that the watchdog timer is reset, and we want to know what's happening. You know, we want to try to figure out what happened that there. And we have a routine called pet dog, which simply writes a bit to the watchdog timer to reset it. And we stick these little calls to the pet dog in order to write to our watchdog timer to restart it everywhere in our code that we want to have the thing that there. We don't put it in loops that if it get hung, gets hung up that bad things are going to happen out there. We, if, it's, if it's in a place where it's waiting for an input that doesn't happen, then, that there, for example, on your gasoline, that there, you know, you're pumping gasoline and it's waiting for an input on the, on the sensor that tells whether your tank is full, right? You, know, you want to go out and read that sensor and then wait so long and read it again, you don't want to put it, you know, the, the right to the watchdog timer while you're actually waiting for the response for the sensor because if that sensor doesn't respond, you want it to reset. You know there's a problem. You know, the sensor has, has gone bad that there. So, but you, while you're in the loop, every t before you read the, go out and read the sensor and you're waiting for the sensor to talk, come back to you, you pet the dog, and then when it comes back, then you pet it again. But while you're waiting for it to read the sensor, then you don't, you don't want it because if it gets hung up waiting for that sensor, that's a place where your program can lock up. Because that sensor goes bad, your program locks up, and you, keep, you flood, flood the, the gas station, petrol station, with petrol all over the ground because the sensor went bad. That there. So that's what it's there for. So critical operations. So... Experiences a hardware or software prevents it from restarting the watcher will overflow and cause the reset. That there. So it's automatically enabled and starts running at the maximum interval, which is 524 mega milliseconds or about half a second at the default clock. So about half every half of a second, if we're running at the default two megahertz clock, we have to pet the dog. We have to talk to this watchdog timer. That there. So if we're running, <coughs> now this time varies as we increase the clock speed. If our clock speed right here goes from 2 megahertz to 16 megahertz, in other words, it's eight times faster, we have to divide that time by eight. So it's a half a second. <coughs> if we're running at 16 megahertz, 
it's going to be about a 30 second, one thirty second of a second that there. So this time is a function of our system clock right there. So it consists of a 21-bit timer running from, pre, from the program system clock. It's generated when the period between the specific rights to its control registers exceeds the program. All we do is we write to a single bit to tell it to reset it. That there. Now we can tell it what our timing li limit is. For some applications, half a second is eternity. And some applications, half a second is plenty. Now, you know, as we're talking about control applications, if you're pumping gasoline, for example, half a second is no big deal right there. But there are some applications where half a second is a long time that there. So it's one of those things that you have to keep keep mind look at the application. I can't think of anything off the top of my head for some reason. I just drew a blank of, you know, when I look at some things like military hardware, you know, half a second between the time you fire a weapon and not fire a weapon could be a long time. That there, you know, you know, it could cause you if you're trying to shoot, you know, hit a jet fighter in the in the air, you know, miss that half second window between the time you fight, you know, enable the weapon and fire it could cause you to, to miss the target. So there are some applications where half a second is too long. For most of the things we're talking about in this class. Or the example is I'm at half a second isn't going to make that there. I mean, if you're talking about, say, the color of paint, you know, a half a second delay between the time you tell it to turn off a particular pigment to the time it actually turns off probably isn't going to change the paint pigment very much that there. Unless, but there are some, some type of, some, some operations such as cutting ICs for, you know, for, for silicon wafers, cutting silicon wafers for ICs. A half a second could be a long time that there. So you have to decide that there. Now you can also enable or disable the watchdog timer. You can lock it to where you can't disable it that there. And you can also permanently, may also be permanently disabled. Everything we've done with it thus far is we've just disabled it. That's all we've done right there. But we want to talk a little, little bit about this a little bit that there. We have a register. Again, it's in that special function register group. Right there, it's called is our watchdog timer control register. Right there, and it's got there. This is just given to you right here. This is a given right there. There's nothing magic about that. It's from the data sheet, and it says, and it simply says that if you write write a five, enables and reloads that. But if you write these E within four clock cycles, you disable the watchdog timer. So normally you would just simply write A A5 to will enable and reload the watchdog timer. That there. That there. So that there. Now watchdog status bit when red reading timer, so it tells you whether it's active or inactive, so you can check to see whether it's active or inactive. Normally you wouldn't do that, you would know whether it's active or inactive because you either turn it on or turn it off. And then you've got the these bits set the watchdog timer interval that there I'm not going to get into that there. They that there there when writing these bits the uh, watchdog timer dot seven must be set to zero. That's the most significant one bit there, but that's what where we're going to set this. For right now, what we're looking at is that we we write a a five to it in order to pet the dog. That there, if we write a five to it and follow with de, then we we turn it off. So if you look at some of the early programs, I I just wrote a five and then then immediately after that I wrote de. That just turns it off. If I just wrote a five then I have to continuously write A5 to it, otherwise it'll reset the processor after so many clock cycles. And since we're not we're not playing doing anything with it, you know, after about half a second it'll re, it will reset the processor. Right there is what that does up there. So that's what the watchdog timer is there for. It's fairly easy to do. It's really all the only thing you have to do really is just remember to write A5 to it every every so often. <laughs> and some watchdog timers are more difficult than others to, 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 uh, to, uh, 
to, to reload. Again, this re enables it and reloads it. Reloads it means it means it starts the count down again, or st starts counting up again. Excuse me, the count it counts up. So we just reload it, so it's going to count again until it gets to, you know, our half a second up there. And as long as we reload it before the next half second is over with, it doesn't do anything. But if we wait more than half a second, then it's going to reset the processor right there. So it causes that there. If we write A5 and follow it within four system clocks, in other words, they have to be right after each other. Because each command is three clock cycles, roughly, right? System clock cycles. So it's got to be move, watchdog, timer control, A5, un meeting command under there, move, watchdog, timer control, DE, right there, immediately right afterwards. You know, that turns, off, turns it off, and we don't, that there. We can also lock it right there. This gets into more detail right here. These are the, the bits that set up our control register right there. Our t there. So as you look at this right here, is that our system clock, this is our time right here that we're between between setting up there and let me just right there okay so we look at this for, can you see that formula there over here on this side here Right there. Oh, there. Okay. As we look at this right here, standard scientific, right there. This formula right here tells us our, that there, our, with a two megahertz clock, it's two million. Right there, one over x. Where's our one over x button on this one here? Right here it is. That's our that's our time per system clock frequency, right there. That's our system. That's this variable right here. Time system clock is one over the system clock frequency, right there. So we we're going to multiply that. I'm just going to store that. There, do we have a store? You have memory, right there. So we take this right here, and this is four. And where's our view? Okay, I guess that, that, that works. Now you can see that, right? Okay, if we look at this formula here, this, this is a number between th 7 and 0. It's 3 bits long, right? Everyone see where that's 3 bits long? And then we add 3 to it, and we write, write, take 4 raises to the... So the, most, the largest value that can be <coughs> is 3 plus 7, so that's 10, right? So 4 raised to the tenth equals times our memory recall. No, oh, that's not right. Yeah, okay. Well, actually, you know what we can do here? We'll just divide it by two million. Let me clear that. Clear. So it's four raised to the tenth divided by two million. Right there, and there's our 524 milliseconds there, or 0.524 seconds right there. That's where that that's where that comes from. If our system clock is 16 megahertz, it would be the same thing: four raised to the tenth divided by 16 million. Right there, and now we're at right about 6.5. Or 65 milliseconds right there. 65.5 milliseconds right there. So that's how we would set our time between that there. But when we write that there, because this.
function right there. So as we look at this right here, this A5 actually is going to put 101 in that, in that right there. Actually 5 right there. So, but these are, this is for the control, this locks it out. So if, but if we want to set this right here, we would put something other than A5 there. We would go ahead and set those bits to 111 if we want it to the maximum time. You know, that sets it to 101, which is not quite the maximum time. You know, that, that 5 is actually sets at 101 right there. So, but that's how we would control that is by writing those three bits. Right there, so intervals written when there is time are written that there, the must be held at logic zero, program interval, after a reset, it's going to, now keep my, right here, this is actually what we've done to disable it right there. That's the C code for disabling it right there. Okay. All right, that's it on the, on the watchdog timer. We'll have to come back and visit that as we're going to use it there. Again, the key thing is, is that typically what we want to do is we want to just keep track of the fact that we're going to reset this thing if, the th if it gets locked up. And it takes a little bit of coding beyond the scope of this course to put little hooks in our code to write the various places to where we know where it locks up. Because <laughs> sometimes it's nice to know where the code locked up so that we can compensate for it. For example, if our gasoline pump sensor goes out, we, we can light an air light and say that there's a problem with that. There. And we may use the may continue to use the pump, but know that it's not going to shut off automatically. Most gas stations in the U.S. will, sh will shut a pump off if, if that sensor goes bad. Here, I don't know if they do or not. Not there, but regardless, not there. Okay, now we're going to get into a little bit here. And actually, my voice is starting to go, but we'll continue going here for a little bit longer here. Okay, this discussion right here gets into this discussion of open drain or push pull. And right here, if we look at a open drain and we look at a transistor, and this could be right here, this is our pin right there. So if we tr if we write a one to this, what we're essentially we're doing is we're putting this to a high impedance on the output. So in other words, we're turning this, so writing a one means we turn off the, tr we turn off the transistor right there. If we write a zero, we have high impedance. High Z right there. So this is what's called an open drain configuration. Is that a question back there or a yawn? <laughs> a, a definite yawn, huh? <laughs> that there, since he ignored me, that there, that there. So, open drain is our normal way that we're going to dry, run our outputs right there. And the reason we do open drain is because this transistor is operating as a switch. A switch is closed or open. A closed switch has how many volts dropped across it? Zero, right? You know, in other words, if we close the switch, there's no voltage drop across it. If we open the switch, then there's no current through it. So we get very, so we don't get any power dissipation, dissipation in the trans, in the microcontroller if we use open drain. So that's our normal way of doing our output, and that's our uh, right there. Now, we can also use <coughs> push-pull, which will cause the port driving at one, will, be, will drive it to BCC. So push-pull means that we write a one to it, we take the output high. If we go open drain and we write a one to it, we open the output. In other words, it's an open impedance right there. 
So those are our two configurations. So if we're going to, for example, turn on an LED, it's, it's very common to use open drain where we turn on the LED by writing a zero to it and that gives, supplies a short right there. So if, if we have an LED tied to this thing right here, and let me Right here, let me. Right here. So if we have a transistor here, and we take this and we tie, here's our VDD or VCC. You're probably used to seeing VCC versus VDD, right? That there. And we run that through a resistor. I'm going to put a 220 because we're dealing with three volts here. It's, if you're dealing with your basic digital, you probably use a 330, which was for, for five volts. And then we have our LED here, right there. So if we write a zero to this, right here, if we write a zero to this, that's going to supply the ground and turn that LED on. If we write a one to this, that's going to open the switch and turn the LED off. And that's why a lot of our circuits, when we turn the LEDs on and off, they're the reverse right there. That's our open drain. Our push-pull means we've got a configuration like this. Right here. Where our output comes from here. And if we turn this transistor on, right here, quite often that's the ground, if we turn this transistor on, this is going to be zero volts. If we turn it on, it's going to have our three volts right there. BDD, our three volts right there. I turned it right at five, but three volts. So it's going to either be three volts or five volts, and that's called a push-pull configuration. So open drain, it's either open or high impedance, or it's ground. Push-pull, it's either it's going to be three volts or it's going to be ground. So you got those two configurations right there. Right there. So we've got our push-pull configuration right here. Open drain writing a zero that's going to, <coughs> to, to the associate pin will cause the port to be driven to the ground. That will turn on LED. If we write a one to it, it assumes high impedance. Writing a push-pull Typically, writing a 1 to it will cause the port to be driven to ground, 0. Writing a 1 will cause it, the port pin to be driven to BCC. But if we pull it to ground externally and we read it, it's going to show up as a 0. So typically, if we're going to use a port as an, as an input, we make it a push-pull, and then we can read it. We write a 1 to it, and then we read it back. And if it's a 1, that means the input's a 1. If it's or, or, or it's floating. If we read a zero, that means the input's a zero. So normally, if we're going to have an input pin, we're going to use it as a push-pull. An output pin, we're normally going to set up as open drain. Right there. So the output modes are determined by the associate bits in the PN mode out registers. These are these are 8-bit registers. There's one for each port that we have on our chip. Now, our particular chip only has two ports, right? That's there, port 0 and port 1, because it's only an 18-pin chip of a, that there, this particular one there. But there, for example, a logic 1 in P1 mode 6 will configure this output to a push-pull right there, a 0. P6 will configure it to an open drain, and we either write a 1 or 0 to these ports right there. Again, logic 1 is going to be push-pull, 0 is going to be open drain, that's the default, open drain. So if we want something to be an input port, we normally would make it a push-pull and then write a 1 to it right there. So, and before we could do that, we have to configure the crossbar and, and that there, and we'll talk about the crossbar probably the last thing, or if not, we'll probably talk about it tomorrow before that, that there. Let me kind of right there. Inputs. 
that their input, an input is setting the output, oh, open drain, okay, excuse me, this particular chip, I had it backwards, open drain, and then we write one to it, that there, we write a one to it, and then we can ground it, right there, so, right there, let me just take a few, I'm going to stop here at this point right here. We'll talk about the, the crossbar probably in my recording lecture. I'm probably going to I want me to stop here at this point. Let me talk about what we're going to be doing in the lab here. This will be posted sometime. And basically all you're going to do is you're just going to add some numbers right there. You have to you have to come up with a code this time. I've got I'm, I'm not going to that there. You have to disable the watchdog timer. I just told you how to do that right there. And these are the numbers code using the code above. Write a program that adds two 16-bit numbers. Write the add carry. These are the two numbers you're going to add. This is a one 8-bit number, and this is or 16-bit number, and this is another 16-bit number right there. So you need to come up with a code tomorrow to add that. I'm not going to write that, this one for you. <laughs> the last one I wrote for you, this one, you need to look at how you're going to do that. The next part of this is multiply. I'm going to skip that one since I'm not going to be here next week, and I'll let you work on that one next week on how to multiply. And I'll go through, and I'll probably have record a little bit of a lecture on how, how you would do that there. But I'm looking at two labs here, B and C. Since I won't be here next week, we're, we're going to go ahead let you do B this week and do C next week. And C simply is we multiply these two numbers right there. And these are 16-bit numbers. And you've got to go back and look at the multiply A, B commands up there. And there's some examples in that book that I, that I posted online. But at this point, I'm letting you figure out how to come up with the code for this. I will be here tomorrow to just simply answer questions. <laughs> up there. So... There. We meet tomorrow what? Ten o'clock, isn't it? Ten. Hmm? Oh, eight thirty. What? Nine. Eight. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I get these two classes mixed up. So, the, so you're the early class down here, yeah. So, so we meet at eight thirty tomorrow. You can show up whatever time you want because you you've got the, this is your assignment. I'm not going to talk tomorrow, so I'm just going to come in here, sit down. And surf the internet. <laughs> so, so you show up at if you show up at 9:30 and you don't get it done, then uh, then 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 you'll have to figure out how to get it done. Come back, you can get the board from the uh, lab tech and finish it up on your own. That there. So, so I, you know, actually, my, my last university, I never took attendance, so I didn't care if people showed up or not. That there. And the reason I, I didn't care is because someone's paying for you to sit in that seat. <laughs> that there, and what are they paying for? You know, and I'll go on record in saying that a diploma or a degree is not worth a single ringgit if you didn't learn anything to get to get that degree. The piece of paper by itself is, you know, you might as well put it in the washroom and use it to, you know, dry your hands. It's <laughs> it's completely worthless. Unless something went in, you know, between the ears, and, and you know how to do some of this stuff when you graduate, because that's what you may get the first job with with your degree. You won't keep it very long if you didn't learn anything in the university. <laughs> you will not keep that job very long at all. And up there, and granted, some of this stuff is some of the some of you will never see this when you graduate, and some of you some of you you will see this a lot, and you'll be you'll. Wish you would have paid more attention. It's one of those cases that they're there. But you know, like I said the degree is up to you what you learn from the degree because that's what's going to get up there. And it's your career 20 years from now is going to make the difference. You know, whether you live in Damazari in the big house, the, the big bungalow, or whether you live in you know. And, and I'm not going to pick on you know compounds, but you know if you live in the, the you know the low cost flats that there all has to do with what you learn at the university and that there because there's college graduates working you know living in both areas and it's the ones that learn to work hard and the university actually one of the things I have a I strongly believe 
is what you should learn in the university is not necessarily the material, but how to teach yourself. That there, because this is this you know this processor is you know this particular processor we're, we're using is just a couple of years old, but the technology is 30 years old. You know the new processors are the ARM processors, and they and the, you know they look the coding's the same. It's the same basic philosophy, but when you start working five years from now, six years from now, and you get in that, you don't know what processor is going to be out there. And you don't know how much, of, how much processing you're going, to, you're going to be using. It's all changes. It's all moving target that there. When I started school, microprocessors were still a graduate level discussion. It wasn't even discussed at the undergraduate level because they were so new. And now, of course, it's being taught in your second semester third semesters. So it's, it's up there. And whoever thought that we would be doing music recordings with microprocessors? You know, we're, you know, we're having computers record music, generate music. Synthesizers are generating, you know, generate that they're, you know, pianos don't hit strings anymore, right? Well, some of them still do, but most of these pianos, you get a key and an oscillator is going to generate a particular frequency depending on what key it is and then a particular filter is going to generate the noise to replicate the sound of a piano. That's all microprocessor, microcontroller controlled that there. So you know, we're looking at things that didn't exist 20 years ago that there. So what's going to happen? And we're seeing more and more of this and not less and less. What you're seeing less and less of is things like RF, <laughs> you know, analog you know, radio communications, you know, that's almost a dying art in some areas other up there, so. All right, with, with that said, I'm going to kind of wind it down. So 8.30 tomorrow is when I'm going to be here. We'll, uh, I'll get the boards, bring them in here. We'll go ahead and get started. This is the lab. I hope to get it posted to, today. Actually, I'm going to probably, I didn't bring my, hopefully I have internet upstairs. If not, we'll print this out, but you can see what it is real quick. It's only the first part that you're going to be doing tomorrow, and that is just exercise B is the only part right there. Is And there's no code given right there. I don't have any code up there. You're just going to write the code right at two 16-bit numbers. Right there, this is... I Actually, there was some code in here that I, I took out. Right, well, no, actually, a... Actually, A is what what you're going to do that right there. Write a program that that A. Whoa, is that thunder out there? What? Out there. It almost sounds like a mortar shell. Out there. So all right, yeah. Part A is you add two eight bit numbers, and part B is add two sixteen bit numbers. So those are the, those are the two parts you'll do. Do tomorrow. Next week we'll do the multiply. So th that's the lab out there. I'll try to get it posted if I've got internet when I get to the office. If I don't, I'll probably post it tomorrow morning in here. Okay. Up there. So. What's that? What's that? Oh yeah, yeah. The whole room's installed now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got yeah. The the, the software is on on all the computers. That there, so that there. So, like I said, just I'll get the boards and just jump to your computer, and then that there. I don't think there's quite enough boards. For, well, for this cluster, there might be enough for everybody. But again, the first part is actually fairly easy. You know, you just simply, you know, that there. Again, there's some examples in that book. I expect you to look at the book. I, I know that's asking a lot, right there. But there's our our numbers that we're going to use. I bite, low bite of the first number. That's for the 16. I don't think I gave you the numbers for the first. Yeah. That adds two 8 bit numbers right there. Right there. But all you do is you just move into A and B and add, and then just store it that there. It's fairly straightforward. It's like three or four instructions. So, okay. And I don't have the internet, so I'm not going to worry about attendance. I'll just put everyone down. So, all right, with that said, let me stop this from recording.